Janet Leith. Today I'm going to be talking about being a musician in the 18th century and how it kind of compares with being a musician today. Often in the early music world we talk a lot about pieces of music, about the works themselves, and we also talk about the composers, often famous composers or well-known composers. But we often forget that, of course, these composers were only a couple of hundreds of musicians who were active at the same time. So, for example, in 18th century London, um, at any one point, you would have had a few hundred musicians working in London alone. So we can think a little bit about how their lives might have looked and whether it's similar to, for example, my life um, as an early musician today. So you would, of course, learn music, and usually from an early age, um, just as we do today. And this would be easier for you in the 18th century if you came from a musical family. It was a very strong um, tradition of uh, music being passed down in the family from father to son, but also from father to daughter later in the century. Um, and uh, this would be a, a kind of foolproof way of getting into the profession. Um, of course, uh, sometimes you would need extra help, so you wouldn't just learn from a relative, uh, you would get a master. And this is very similar to how you would learn with a particular teacher in a conservatoire today. Although there weren't conservatoires uh, until much later, uh, with the Royal Academy of Music being started in the early 19th century, um, still there were options for studying with someone famous. So for example, uh, you might study if you were a violinist, with Francesco Gimignani, who uh, had uh, learnt with Corelli and uh, therefore could advertise himself in London as being able to sort of uh, teach that style and pass it down uh, to you. So uh, this was a, very, a great way of, of learning um, sort of the best technique um, and to emulate the style of the great, uh, the great performers. So this is one way you could do it. You could also learn from treatises. And so if you didn't have quite enough money to be able to learn with a master, um, there were publications which would help you. And again, people like Gimignani would publish these in order to help their own students and to help those who didn't have masters. And those would help with technique and harmony and learning figured bass and other important uh, musical precepts. Also, later in the century, um, it became much more common to play music in the home. And so uh, musicians would often teach wealthy aristocrats, um, wealthy families, mainly amateur musicians. It was quite unusual for um, a wealthy uh, elite member of society to become a professional musician because this would have involved um, stepping down in class, unfortunately. And uh, being paid for money was not seen as something that was particularly, um, I don't know, it, it was it was a socially mobile kind of enterprise, but but not one that you would choose to do if you already had wealth. Um, but musicians were able to sort of move move through society very flexibly in the eighteenth century, just as we do today, arguably. Um, and you needed patrons, but you could also um, work um, and find your own connections as well. Um, concert series were starting up at this point, um, but it was still very important um, to uh, work to have employment with wealthy families, for example. Uh, the Duke of Chandos, I'm sure you know, um, employed Handel and many, many other in um, uh, musicians at his, in his household. Um, and although there weren't, weren't so many um, like him who had full musical establishments, uh, most families were employing Italian masters by the end of the century. So there was a lot of work to be had. Um, and you also uh, had a sort of sense in which musicians, just like we are today, had to do a lot of different things to make money, uh, to make a sort of viable career. Um, so as, you, as, as is the case now, um, a few individuals would be able to make a career from performing solo, but perhaps even less so in the 18th century. Um, a lot of even the best musicians uh, ended up in poverty for some reason, um, whether it be I, towards the end of their life they were unable to play and there was no way of um, sustaining their their family um, so it was often pretty difficult um, so musicians had to be able to do lots of different things so you would be able to perform perhaps on two instruments if not three um, in orchestras solo various different ways 
and you would also need to be able to teach for sure, um, just as I do today. I do quite a bit of teaching and very much enjoy it. And um, so they would advertise this in the newspapers and they might also copy music, for example. So that's something you could do if you needed a bit of extra cash. Um, because, of course, uh, you couldn't just order something from the publisher. Uh, you would often need to copy it out um, for all the musicians you had there. Um, and other things, you could sell tickets for theatre, you could get involved in musical performances at the theatre, you could run a concert series yourself. Lots of different things that you could do to earn money as a musician. So we call it a portfolio career these days, but in fact in the 18th century it was very, very much the same thing. I'm now going to play a movement from a sonata by Godfried Finger. Finger was a Moravian viol player who came to London in 1687. He was successful and he published a uh, collection of tuneful solos um, designed for um, amateurs in general. And this is the kind of thing that uh, wealthy amateurs would have been learning with their musical teachers um, at this point. But Finger, of course, um, this, you know, we've forgotten him today rather sadly, but he was a very good composer, as you'll hear. Unfortunately, though, he had a dramatic end to his career in London. He failed to win a very important competition and was so offended that people didn't like his composing style that he left London never to return. <laughs> century musician? Well, in this sense, I think there might be many similarities. Um, so for when a musician came to London, uh, perhaps from Europe or indeed from Scotland, for example, they might have stayed um, in some lodgings, usually above a shop, and they might have stayed there for the rest of their career unless they had a sort of lucky break. Um, so for example, James Oswald, my famous Scottish Baroque composer, my favourite rather, um, not as famous as I'd like, um, he lived above a lace shop on the Strand. Um, and he had a shop in St Martin in the Fields on the pavement of the churchyard, um, but I think he probably still continued to live above the lace shop um, for some time. And uh, this is the kind of thing that would be quite normal. Uh, the area that musicians tended to live was around the theatres, so Leicester Square, Covent Garden, the Strand and St Martin's. Um, these were the artistic hubs of London at the time. And it wasn't particularly salubrious or expensive to live there, very different from nowadays. Um, now, musicians, we have to live very much in the outskirts of London um, to be able to work here. And it's really challenging. Often, um, if you're fortunate enough to couple up, then it's a little easier. Um, but if you, uh, a lot of us can end up flat sharing until quite late in our lives. So, again, very similar in some respects. Um, and, of course, the places we perform are not altogether different. So, if, you know, a musician might play in concert series, for example. Um, plenty of wonderful concert halls here in London. They're probably a little bigger than concert halls were in the 18th century, um, because a lot of the concert series at the beginning of the 18th century um, were very small, and they were often in taverns, or indeed in someone's house in their front room. Um, so a bit more informal. For example, the fantastic uh, concert series of the Coleman, Thomas Britton, um, or John Bannister. Both of these men set up um, kind of soiree evenings, as it were, um, with the great and the good and all sorts of people piling into their, into their rooms um, to have a good evening. 
Um, but as the century went on, concerts became a bit more uh, formal uh, and a little bit more like uh, our concerts today. So that's one place you might have performed. Um, also in the theatre, again, uh, loads of theatres um, now, uh, not right now because of the pandemic, but usually um, will require pit musicians um, for most days of the week, and this was the case as well in the 18th century. And of course, uh, in the theatres, there was also a very interesting tradition which doesn't exist today. This is the one difference. So if I was a recorder player in the 18th century, in the early 18th century, I might have performed in, in between acts at the theatre. Um, and uh, lots of musicians used to do this. This was a good way of earning a bit, a bit of extra cash if you were in the orchestra already. You might get on stage um, in between um, the acts and do a concerto. Uh, even if it had no relation whatsoever to the play or the, uh, to the pantomime or whatever was going on, um, you might just do that. And um, actually huge fees were demanded for these entracte performances. And recorder players often did perform concertos. Um, William Babel, for example, did so. Um, James Pezibler as well. And they were very, very virtuosic indeed. Um, so I like to think that that's what I would have been doing um, in 18th century London, as well as no doubt selling a bit of music um, as well as I've always kind of fancied having a music shop. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me. And next week, I'm actually going to be talking about the harpsichord, or rather I'm going to get Tom to help me talk about the harpsichord. Um, and he's going to demonstrate this particular harpsichord, which is really, really beautiful, um, by Alan Gotto, and talk a little bit about how he learnt the harpsichord and the various different things he does when he's accompanying me on the recorder. See you next time.